impact us, let it speak to us, let it communicate to us. You said that your word is like the snow and the rain that comes down from heaven and flourish the earth and give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So is your word. It will never come back void. It will have prospered to that in which you have sent it. And we accomplish that in which you command. Father, we pray that your word, which is like the snow and the rain, and the ground is our heart, and that your word will sink into our hearts and will begin to yield forth fruit in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Holy Ghost, we thank you because you're here. Take control in this midst. You are the manifestation of signs and wonders and miracles. You are the healing power. Even in your presence, as we begin to speak, let healing take place. As we speak, let wonders and your signs take place. As we speak, let miracles take place. As we speak, let your divine power move in this atmosphere and do those things that you know how to do best. We rely on you. We depend on you. <coughs> in Jesus' name, and let the church say it. Amen. 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 And let the church say Amen. Amen. First Samuel, I want to give you something that you will hold on to this year. I want to give you something that you will, something that you are going to hold on this year. And no matter the circumstances you are going to go through, I want you to follow me very intensively. And in fact, if you feel, if you feel very dizzy, you have to stand up and shake your body. Because today, one word, one word that God is going to speak to us, don't let one word pass by you. One word pass by you. First Samuel chapter 17 from 42. You know the story of David and you know what happened with David. And you know his victory. But you will see there's a secret that David had that others didn't have. There's always a secret for victory. And there's always a profession for victory. You see, God has given us everything that is pertaining to life and godliness. In fact, God has already done the victory already. But every child of God has a role to play somehow. You will need to step into the victory that God has given to you. And so David tells us, when the Philistines looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking, which means David was dirty, but he was good looking. Have you ever realized that God always tells you that you're beautiful? You've never seen in the scripture that God says anyone is good, ugly. God always tells you you're beautiful. God says you're good looking. Amen. So that's the courage. That's what you have to, you need to know that no matter what, you are beautiful. No matter what, you are courageous. You don't need someone to tell you from outside to know that you are beautiful. Don't allow the world to give you a compliment, to make you feel you are not beautiful. You are beautiful. You are easily and beautifully made. Amen. And then watch this. David and Goliath. Who was, who was the Philistine? It was Goliath. So Goliath looked at David and said, look at this small boy. He's dirty and he's come to find me. Watch what the next scripture says. So the, so the Philistines, Goliath said to David, am I God that you have come with me in the stick? And the Philistine caused David by his God. No matter what the enemy has said to you, no matter what have been said to you in your village, no matter what have been said to you by your brothers or family members, no matter what they say that in our family, oh, maybe there's a cause and that cause is running your family. That cause, if it's not from God, it will not stay in the name of Jesus Christ. Because God, no matter how devil costs you, devil cause can never stay in your life because you are ordained and you are a child of God. So Goliath caused David with his God. But watch this. And the Philistine, and the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, What 
are you saying to the enemy every time they speak to you? What do you say to the enemy? Because you must say something back to the enemy. If you don't say something back to the enemy, the enemy will have his victory. So David said to the Philistines, You come to me with sword, with spear, and with javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. Tell somebody, I will come with the name of the God of the host. In the name of the Lord of hosts. And the God of the armies of Israel. That was Israel. And God of Israel is the same God of you. It doesn't matter which country you represent. God is the God of your country. Hallelujah. He says, I come to you in the name of the God of hosts and the God of the armies of Israel. Whom you have defied. Whom you have defied. Everything that speaks against God has defied God and has no power over your life. Everything that defied God has no power over your life because it's not from God. Watch this. And then, this day, watch what they said. This day you be delivered into my hands. How did David know that Goliath would be given into his hands? When others have run away from Goliath for 40 days, how did David knew that he would deliver Goliath? You see, because he knows the God that he serves. Saul and David brothers, they hid for 40 days and 40 nights. Goliath was coming up and threatening everybody. Everybody was hiding. All the children of God, they hide. Even though God was with them, but they never knew that God was with them. Because their relationship with God didn't give them the confidence that God is able to deliver them. And I will strike you and take your head from you. This day I will give the carcasses of the cow of the Philistines to the birds of the earth and the wild beasts of the earth. That all the earth, did you see that? All the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. All the earth. David prophesied. Do you know when David was fighting this? There were not a lot of countries were not yet in place. Some countries were not even in existence. But David had prophesied that the whole earth we hear the story. People don't know about the Bible, but everybody knows about the story of David and Goliath. So many people have not read the Bible, but they know the story of David and Goliath because David prophesied. What is this? My message is today. Then all this assembly shall know the Lord does not save with sword and spear. But for the battle, oh my God, write this down. You need to write it down. For the battle is of the Lord. This year, Everything that come against you, every challenge that you fight, you will say, the battle is not mine, is of the Lord. Write this down. You need to write it down in your calendar. You need to write it down in your paper. You need to write it down and make it known. Paste it in your world. Paste it in your family home. Paste it wherever you say, no matter what you go through, look at the world and look at your phone and say, this battle is not mine, but is of the Lord. David said, the battle is not mine, Goliath. That's why I am very confident that I'm going to defeat you because I know this battle is not mine and it's of God. And everyone that God fights, you go down. It doesn't matter how big you are. If God, if God comes against you, you are going down. And that's why I was very confident. And that's why we are very confident that at the end, God will win Satan. Satan is carrying a lot of people, but at the end, God will have more than Satan. Hallelujah. Because God is always victorious. This battle is not mine, but is of the Lord. This battle is not mine. This battle, this problem that you're going through, that sickness is not yours, but the Lord will carry that sickness and heal you. That pain is not yours. The Lord will free you from it. That problem is not yours. The Lord will set you free from it. This battle is not mine. Five things. This battle is not mine, but of the Lord. 
The battle is the law. The battle is the law. Five secrets. The battle is the law. Do you know how many stones David picked? Amen. How many stones did David pick? Five. How many did he use? Do you know the remaining four stones were four? Goliath had four brothers. Go and study this. He had four brothers and all of them were giants. So David picked five, but he finally used one. The battle is the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. So God works in figure and he doesn't do things anyhow. Why did God tell David to pick five stones and why did God, David use only one? Because, you see, God shows us that every victory that he comes in is not by strength. That's why God told Gideon, Gideon, I don't need many people to go and fight a battle. You are going to fight thousands of people. I only need 200 that are obedient and committed. The rest should go. I will use the 200 and win thousands. God doesn't, God is not interested. God is interested in commitment. God is interested in those who trust him. Those who can rely on him. And he wants to use those who rely on him to capture and to win victories. Are you ready to be used by God today? Are you ready for you to trust in God and to depend in God no matter what you go through? Are you ready to remember this word that this battle, the battle is the Lord. The battle is the Lord. Tell somebody beside you, the battle is the Lord. Maybe that person is not hearing you very well. Tell somebody else again, the battle is the Lord. Hallelujah. I can hear it from here. I feel your faith. You know, the Bible says in the book of Hebrew, it says what God told them, they did not mix it up with faith. So it did not work. They didn't mix it with faith. They didn't mix what God told them with faith. And so what God is telling you, you have to mix it up with faith. And faith is the substance of evidence of the thing that you have hoped for, but you haven't seen it. Amen. So you don't have to see your victory before you know that your victory is coming. David didn't know that he's going to cut Goliath, but he knew inside that already Goliath is a gone case. A gone case. He knew that Goliath is big and massive and tall. But some people say, according to Bible theologians, say he's 11 feet. But whatever feet he is, he was a giant, the Bible says. And David was so small. He's not the number of size. He is the God that you have inside of you. Amen. How big is your God inside of you? So I want you to write that down. That's not our message today, but I wanted you to have that so that any time you go through any circumstances, you will remember that the battle is the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Today, we are going to have communion. And, but before we have communion, we also have to talk about communion. What is, what is communion? What is communion? What is communion? What do you think is communion? Communion, when we, what is, is in English, it's called communion. But what is this? What is the, what is the meaning of this? What is the message of this? What is the word communion? It's a question to the whole church. What is communion? Jesus told us in Matthew, I will not drink this with you now until in heaven when we sit together. I will drink this with you, this communion and this cup. Jesus says it's a New Testament. So what is communion? First Corinthians chapter 11, 27. Wherefore, whosoever 
shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall the guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Not this. When Paul was writing this, he said, Whosoever shall, whosoever shall do what? Eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord. He didn't say it belongs to somebody else. He says it belongs to who? God. It is of God. And shall drink it unworthily. I want you to take note of that word. Because he didn't say unworthy. Every one of us, we are worthy before God. You know why? Because Jesus has already paid the price. So you are worthy before God. If me and you are not worthy, we will never ever be privileged to stay before God. So we are very worthy. But what Paul was saying to us here is a Greek word that is called anasios. Anasios means disrespectful, dishonoring. That is the word anasios. Anasios. A-N-A-Z-I-O-S. Anasios is a Greek word. Unworthily. And that's why I told you the Bible is, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew and the New Testament is written in Greek. And so many words that you have, maybe some of the Bible words are translated in your own language. And those words have been nullified that you don't know the original context. And sometimes it's translated in English and one English word can mean hundred things. But the Bible has its own meaning. It says, anyone that shall drink this cup unworthily, it means anasios, you drink it disrespectfully. He says, it shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Before, when I was young, and many of you, you know those days, when it's communion time, we will be able to see, we will know those that have done something wrong the night before. Because when it's communion time, you see people begin to separate themselves. Because they were afraid that if they take communion, something bad will happen to them and even some of those priests that were holding the cup when they hold the cup they are shaking their hands and said make sure you check your life very well you know and everybody will be afraid but do you know what communion does for you communion brings you closer to god Communion, every time you have walked <coughs> wrongly to God, every time you have done something wrong, it is the best time to take communion because when you take communion, you are remembering what Jesus did for you. So communion brings us closer. Write this down. Communion is fellowship. The word communion, this that you see, the drink and the bread, is called fellowship. It is a Greek word called Kononia. Kononia, which means communion is fellowship. So the Lord said, examine yourself. So if you know, examine yourself. Examine yourself, think. So he's saying, examine yourself. Do you have an attitude? Is there somebody in the church? Maybe is there somebody in the church that you don't like to greet? Is there somebody in the church that you just hate? Even though you know that you are a Christian, but you don't like that person. He said, examine yourself. Hallelujah. He said, don't come and drink this cup. Don't come and drink it unworthily. Don't come with disrespect. Because no matter what you go through, no matter the hate, no matter the bitterness, no matter the pain, when you come in God's presence, you are supposed to drop it down instantly. That's what God wants. And that's what is the purpose of fellowship. Fellowship makes you to forget about pain. Fellowship makes you to forget about hate. Fellowship makes you to forget about bitterness. Fellowship makes you to forget about sin. Because in God's presence, there is no hate. In God's presence, there is no bitterness. Every bitterness that comes before God's presence has to die. This is what fellowship is. This is what communion is. That's why God wants us to take it even as often as you take it. Because every time you 
do, you are remembering what Jesus Christ did. And every time me and you remember Jesus Christ, what happened to our life? Our life changed. Our life changed. So this is the right time to take it, not the time to put off the glory of God. This is the time to receive more of his glory. Hallelujah. Drinking the cup of only refers to an attitude, refers to your character. What kind of character do you have? Do you know there are a lot of people in church, they quarrel with A, brother, sister, D, D. They have hate so much for Christian brothers and sisters and they are still in church. Some people do not even want another race. They don't want to sit in church with another race. How can you be a Christian and you are not comfortable with another kind of Christian? It means that there is no love of God in you. Your attitude needs to change. Let's see verse 28 to 30. Let's see verse 28 to 30. Verse 28 to 30. Are we there? Yeah. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh what? Damnation. Do you see that? To who? To what? To himself. Not designing the lost body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many do what? Sleep. When you begin to walk arrogantly out of love, God is not saying that you're not going to go through situations. But God is saying that if in, in his presence and you begin to be arrogant, even in his presence, he said you are causing pain to your body. He can cause you to be sick. He can even cause you to be dead. Yes. Is it not there in the scripture? That's why every Christian has to walk in love. I told you, there are many Christians. I was in Estonia when I was preaching in Estonia. And I stood in the pulpit of, of the altar. I, and the Lord spoke to me and the Lord said, Tell them, anyone that is a racist here, if you like, you are, you are which color you are, which color you are having, and you don't like the other colors, you hate them. You will never, you will never heaven, make heaven. And God told me, tell them, anyone that has hate any color or hate any tribe or hate any people and they don't like, that person will never make heaven. And I stood there and I said, God said, if you know you have love and you still have hate and you are erased and you divide yourself and begin to separate yourself, it says you don't know me and you don't have my love and you will not make heaven. A lady came to me and she was crying. She said, for 27 years, 27 years ago, she was a student. She was very young. And she met a foreigner in the bus. And this foreigner was coming into the bus. And the foreigner touched her. She went home. She took sponge and washed herself for one hour. Because she was working with ignorance. And when I said that, that moment in that church, she came out and she was crying. She said, this was 27 years ago. She doesn't have the right. She cannot see this foreigner any longer. But she said, please, she knows I'm a foreigner. Can she give me a hug to repay her wrong? And when she hugged me, she went down on the floor and she was broken. And immediately, the pain. Because every child of God, it doesn't matter. You must have love. Because God is love. God is love. God is love. It doesn't matter. Somebody might make you be angry. Somebody might make you be offended. You might be pissed up. But no, don't allow your don't allow that to drag you into hate or to drag you into the place where you begin to separate people from the others. If you find yourself in another country, you find yourself in another place, 
It doesn't matter who you see. It doesn't matter who you see. Every child of God, we are one in Christ. So he did not say, not designing. Watch what he says in verse 20. He did not say, not designing the Lord's blood. He says, not designing the Lord's what? body. Did you see that? He didn't put blood now. He referred it to Christ's body alone. Why didn't he put the blood? Why only the body? Because Christ is the head and the body is what? The church. Christ is the head and the body is the church. So he says, when you do this, you are not designing the Lord's body. Did you see that? He didn't put blood. First, he began with blood and body, but now he, he ex emphatically separated blood and put only the blood. body. Why? Because Christ is the head of the church and his body is the church. So when you don't, when you begin to disrespect your fellow brothers and sisters and begin to act arrogantly and begin to disrespect arrogantly and you don't care, you know what you don't care. He says you are disrespecting the body of Christ. That's why a lot of Christians have to be very careful how they do things and what they say around. So he said, for this reason, many are sick. Many just die. They don't know why, what has caused their pain in their body. They don't know what they have done to themselves because they have, they have dis not designed the lost body and they have opened the door for the devil to strike. It's not going to be your portion, my portion in the name of Jesus Christ. So he says, for we being many are one bread and one body for all partakers of that one bread. We being many, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 16 to 17. For we being many, we are one. We are many, but we are one. Why are we many, but we are one? We are many, but we are one body. It's not two body. Jesus' body is not two. It's one. Even though we are many, but one body. Did you see that? Yes. 1 Corinthians 10, chapter 10, 16 to 17. Did you see it? 1 yes. Corinthians 10, 16 to 17. Can we read it together? <clears throat> because of this blessing, which we bless, is it not the communion? See, he's asking you a question. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we pray. Is it not the communion of where? The body of Christ. So the blood, you might say it's a juice, but it's a juice, but it represents the blood. Hallelujah. Because the kingdom of God is a spiritual thing. It's not something that your optical eyes can figure. It is a spiritual thing. He said the bread will break. Is it not the body? It's asking you. And verse 17. For what? For we don't mean it are one bread and one, one body. For we are all partake of that one bread. For we, though many, amen, though we are many, we are one bread and one body. For we all partake of one bread. Hallelujah. So we are in covenant relationship. Do you understand what is the covenant relationship? The covenant is not a covenant that we are making with God. You cannot make covenant with God. It's not possible because God has already made a covenant and he's not making a new covenant. God doesn't make covenant with people. No, he has already made one covenant with Jesus Christ, cut it off, he started with Abraham and ended up with Jesus Christ and that covenant is finished. So, but we are covenant in our self relationship. That's why when a man and a woman get married, they have a covenant. Amen. The covenant is not with God, it's within man. So we have covenant with each other and that covenant is relationship with Jesus Christ. With one another. The covenant of relationship is a sacred covenant. And that covenant with ourselves must not be broken. This is why Master commanded us to walk in love.
So the blood of Jesus Christ is not about just sin because many people have the sin consciousness. Jesus shed, did not only shed his blood because of sin, he also did it to establish what? Jesus did not only shed his blood for sin, but what did he also shed his blood for? To establish a new covenant. The blood was not only for sin, the blood established a new covenant. Because a lot of people, when they think about Jesus' blood, they just think about sin, sin, sin. It's not only sin. His blood established a new covenant. And that covenant is the covenant of love. Hallelujah. It's a new covenant. That's why he says in the last supper with his disciples, he said, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Matthew 26, 28. This is this is my blood of what? The of the new covenant. Did you see? Which is shed for the remission of sins. sins. So his blood was shed for sins and his blood established a new okay. covenant. Hallelujah. Okay. Hallelujah. Okay. So the shedding of the blood was for two reasons. It established a new covenant and also shed the sin of the whole world. This is very important to know. You can write it down. The blood of Jesus took away the sin of the whole world and the blood of Jesus begins a new covenant. This is the best way to plead the blood. I don't have a problem with that. You see a lot of Christians when they're praying, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, I plead the blood. No, 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 no. This is the best way. When you begin to, when you begin to take the communion, you are automatically using the blood and pleading it very well. Because when Jesus shed the blood on the cross of Calvary, he shed it, but what was important, his body that he sacrificed, his body that he sacrificed as a, as a person was the sacrifice that God needed. Amen. So this is the best way to pray. Every time you want to, every time you feel you, you feel you want to protect your family, every time you feel you want to you, you want to protect what God has given to you, every time you feel you want to take domain, just take communion. And as you begin to take communion, and as you begin to share communion in fellowship and in love, you are pleading automatically the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not something you go, I plead the blood, I plead the blood, I plead the blood, I plead the blood. No, no, it's not something. It's something that is an act of obedience. Hallelujah. And that's why sometimes we do things arrogantly. We do things out of anger. And we need to retreat from those steps. Sometimes we even punish children. We punish them because we are angry. But the punishment has to be from love. Amen. Not because we're angry. It has to, yes, we might be angry for what they do. But the punishment has to be because of love. Because you want them to be better. And so we do those mistakes. So that's why we have to, we repent from those trips. And begin to walk in God's perfect love. Hallelujah. Hebrew 12, 9 to 10. There is judgment for those who will not, who will not walk in love. Okay. Furthermore, we have the human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be subjection to the fathers of the spirit and live? To the fathers of the spirit and live. They are spiritual fathers. Amen. To this fathers of the spirit and live. He said, Father, we have human fathers who corrected us and we pay them respect. Did you see that? We have human fathers and we pay them respect. He says, Shall you not want to already be subject to the father of the spirit that lives? God will never. God will never, God can, but will never do anything for you without using human being. 
God can, but we never do anything for you without using human beings. That's why God has put people in your life. And there are people that are very important in your life. And until you see them as important, you might not be stepping, you might be stepping out of victory. He says, he says you don't know. Go out to verse 10. Watch this. He said, For they indeed, for few days, chasing us as seen best of them, but for our prophets, that we may be partakers of his holiness. We may be perfect partakers of his holiness. We may partake of his holiness. So, chastisement is to make you have a good fellowship in communion. Hallelujah. The last scripture, Galatians 6.10. Galatians 6.10. you to do good to everyone but he wants your good to begin first with who <coughs> with the household of faith I tell you if you cannot if you cannot call your brother or your sister in church regularly and you are calling someone outside it means that you're not doing a good practice yes maybe you're not good in making phone calls but you see you have to begin to find a way to connect Find a way to, re to relate. Find a way to pray together. Find a way to connect. Find a way to rob. Why? Because the household of faith is very important. And that's why some Christians, you see, of course you can do good and do good and do good. There are a lot of Christians, they are suffering too. They are suffering. Some don't have bus cards. Some don't have food. Some don't have even house rent. But some people are doing good to others. They do good to even... People who are not Christians, it's not a problem. But God says, especially to Christians, you must take care of yourself. You must take care of, we must take care of ourselves. It's very important. Take care of yourself. How do you do? Take care of the ones you already have. Take care of the ones you have. Build the ones that you have. Create, that's why I say, spend energy on the ones you have. That's to show how to, to pour your energy. Because sometimes you can be spreading your energy out of way. But it's very important. Take care of the house of faith. This is important. Shalom before you go. You take it to me. It's important. This is the blood breaking for you. And it's blood shed for you. So as we come and begin to come towards this table, this is a table. This table will heal and will fortify your bone and your marrow and your joints. This table will heal you from every sickness because God is able to heal. This sickness, this table will take away your pains from you. This, this table will restore you. It doesn't matter what you might be going through. It might even be a family problem that is extended. Your family might be going through. As you come to this table, as you take this communion, begin to intercede and begin to target your families and say, Father, as I take this, let the problem that my family is going through, let that problem be carried by you in the name of Jesus Christ. As we walk to this. Thank you, Father. We have Pastor Nick to come and serve us in the communion. Pastor Nick, please come and serve us. He will bless the communion and serve every one of us the communion. Thank you, Father Lord.